Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is Joel, the disaster of all disasters, part two. We're in the book of Joel and we're working through the highlights in the Old Testament. The problem with the minor prophets is, is there's the whole thing as a highlight, basically. There are just three chapters. I mean, how do you hit a highlight in three chapters? Well, that's uh, difficult to do. Uh, but nonetheless, we are going to be, and we were last time in Joel, we've, the third time now, I believe, that we're in the book of Joel and we'll be done. There's only three chapters there, so it really is not the highlights. It's really kind of the whole thing. I was, uh, chapter three, we're going to be in Joel just a bit. I heard a story this past week of about a, a guy, a homeless guy, who was, uh, went up to a, a house, looked relatively wealthy house, and uh, asked for some food. He says, I would, haven't had a decent meal in quite some time. And he said, could I, uh, could I impose upon you for uh, either some money or, or food or both? And and the owner of the house said, I've, I've made a living off of not giving away things for free. He says, so I'll tell you what. He says, if you go around to the back of the house, he says, you're going to find a can of paint and a fresh brush. And he says, if you will paint my porch for me, when you're done, I will feed you. I'll make sure that you're fed. And so uh, the guy says, okay, that's a deal. And he goes around to the back of the house and he uh, finds the paintbrush and he begins to paint about an hour and a half later, he comes back to the front and knocks on the door, and the guy's a little surprised. He's like, it should have taken him longer than this. But he says, so you finished painting the porch? He said, absolutely. He says, so come on in. He says, I'll make sure they bring you some good food. And, and he sits him down. He begins to eat. And, uh, and he goes to the guy, and he says, so how was it? He says, how was the porch? He says, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. He says, you don't know your cars very well. He says, that's not a porch back there. That's a BMW, he said. <laughs> come on. Selective hearing, can we, can we call that selective hearing? Yeah. Hearing what you want to or hearing only part of what you want to uh, or taking, as in the case of this person, hearing what they say and turning it into something, turning it into something different. Uh, selective hearing is, I guess in some case, it depends on who you are. If, if, if you're the one having selective hearing, it's pretty beneficial, at least in my case. But if you're dealing with someone who's had selective hearing, it's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Well, uh, we tend to have, we tend to hear, have selective hearing with regards to the Bible and in particular God. Uh, we tend to do that. We all do, not just, not just you, me, we all do. Because we prefer, we all do, prefer to hear what we want to hear and prefer not to hear what we don't want to hear. I mean, we're all that way. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what, what makes me feel good. Tell me what's going to make me happy. Tell me what's going to bring me up, not what's going to bring me down. We have this selective hearing or this desire to hear selectively. We prefer to focus, for instance, on the love and forgiveness and kindness and mercy and grace of God as opposed to judgment and wrath. I don't know how many people just love to study judgment and wrath, but I would say if that's you, you're a little bit weird. I think most of us want to hear good news. I want to hear good stuff. I want to hear stuff that makes me feel makes me feel warm, and there is definitely that kind of stuff in the Bible, but when we come across passages like we do here in the book of Joel, which is not necessarily heartwarming, and the whole book of Joel, like I said, is just a short book, uh, it's very heavy on the judgment and wrath side of things with regards to God. Uh, it sort of is a, a snaps us back to reality, the full picture of who God is. And so we need to constantly be reminding ourselves of how, how important it is that we be balanced. And not just focus on the things that we want to hear or the things that maybe people want to tell us, but really the bottom line of what is the Bible, the whole Bible actually say, which means we're going to have to be proficient in it. We can't just sit around and wait for someone to feed us stuff uh, because we may, get, we may get only what he wants to say, what he's comfortable with. We have to make sure we're feeding ourselves as well and then also reminding, pulling ourselves back into the middle and saying, what does the whole Bible have to say about these subjects? So is, is God a loving God? Yes, he is. Whoever does not love, it says, does not know God because God is love. He's the epitome of it. He's the definition of it. But on the other hand, so if, if we just jump off of this verse, by the way, a very popular verse with all religions, this verse is. A lot of religions are way into that one. Oh, yeah, God's love, God's love, God's love. But is he love to the extent to where everybody's going to be in heaven? So God is love, and so he just loves us so much that, that here's the philosophy, that he's not going to let anyone go to hell Hell is actually a mirage. It's not actually going to happen. There's no one going to actually be there. God, because God is love, God's going to be rescuing every single person. So every person on the planet, no matter who they are and what they've done with God in this life, God's going to find a way to forgive them and make them right with him. Is that true? 
That's the position of universalism. You're familiar with the universalist church. You'll know that they are a church. It, well, you could better, here's a better uh, title for the church. The church for the selective hearing. They're very selective in what they hear about God. What they hear about God is what you're seeing on the screen. And they won't hear anything else about him. But if you're going to read the Bible, you're going to have to not be selective in hearing. If you really want to know who God is, you're going to have to take in the full order view of who he is. And so, likewise, we have God who is love. We also have this in John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Isn't that awesome? And that's the whole gospel right there. He who believes on the Son has eternal life. It is that Simple. You say it can't be. I'm saying yes, it can. It says it over and over again in the scriptures. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, the same thing, shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Notice, he who believes on the son has. It's past tense. Soon as you accept him, you're done. You're with him forever. That's how awesome the gospel of, of Jesus Christ is, how awesome the work that God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. He who believes in the son has eternal life, but, like I said, for universalists out there, and I hope there are none of you, there is a huge but in the Bible. You've got to take it for what it says. But he who does not obey the son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. That same word is used in other places in the scripture to refer to how the waters cover the sea. How well do the waters cover or abide over the sea? Fully. Completely. So the wrath of God is going to fully and completely cover the one who does not trust Christ as personal Savior. Listen, that is not universalism. That is the full armed, full concept view of who God is. And we have to have both of those working at all times. So, so on the one hand, we say God is love. On the other hand, do we understand that God is not all 100% love? God will definitely throw people in hell and there will definitely be people there. People say, well, I don't, I don't believe that kind of stuff. I just believe the stuff that I want to believe. So let me get this straight, if that's you. So the criterion as to what is true and what is not true is what you can stomach. So you must be God then. Since you determine what is actually accurate and what is inaccurate. No, you're not God. So we need to take God for what it says. And we, we really, really do. So God is love. God is also hate. So we'd love to read those verses. Here's some non-universalist verses for you, if you will. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. It's straight out of the Bible. Straight out of the Bible. The whole Bible is what you need. You need to be balanced in your understanding of God. We need to be balanced in our presentation of God. If a person doesn't understand that God hates iniquity and those who do iniquity, then why would they ever come to Jesus? See, if, I, if, if whether or not Jesus died for me, God still loves, accepts me, and is merciful to me and forgives all my sins, then why do I really need to come to Jesus anyway? It was kind of a waste of his time, wasn't it, to send Jesus? I mean, it was a nice show of gesture of love. If you understand that God hates iniquity and those who commit iniquity, you understand why Jesus had to die. Because God, if you die like that, if you pass out of this life in a position of hate, you're in trouble. You're eternally in trouble. Again, uh, the Bible's not just one or two verses about this kind of stuff. Psalm 11, verse 5, the Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates there's no way to, I mean, like he hates it vividly, richly. It's like this, the, the deepest part of who he is. Unless you understand this about God, then what he's done for us in the kindness and mercy through his son will not make sense. It will not make sense. Again, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to do evil, to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. You say, well, um, yeah, that's, but, but we, can't, we can't show this to people because they may get the wrong impression of God. Guys, they already have the wrong impression of God. They, get, they have an impression of this milk toast God that we're presenting to them from our pulpits and from our churches that God is just an old man sitting in heaven letting people in the back door. That is not the God of the Bible. That may be the God who you want him to be, 
But that is not the accurate God. And I would submit to you, if you're not presenting the accurate God, you're not presenting God at all. It's not like I present half of God and they're missing the other half, and so they're getting 50%. No, the 50% God, the selective hearing God, does not exist. He's just nothing. He's a nothing. And neither does that God call anyone to repentance and call anyone to salvation through Christ because that God does not exist. It's a falsification. It's a figment of our imagination. And I should say, promoted by none other than the devil himself. It's not just, oh, well, he's half God and so it's okay. No, he's a demonic God, a satanic God that is not true. And no one comes to faith in him because there's nothing to believe in at all. And we throw our hands up because our nation is falling away from God. And I would sort of disagree with that. On one hand, I say yes. The other hand, I say no. But they're not falling away from God. Our nation's maybe the most spiritual, maybe the most religious as it's ever been. Of course, they're not in our churches, but they're, they're spiritual to be sure. Our, our, nations are, our nation is going headlong after, after the God that we've conjured up in our churches. And from our pulpits, a God who's nothing, listen, but love and blessings and prosperity and forgiveness. He's nothing other than that. And I would say that to you, if that is all God is to you, if that all is the only God that you know is a God of love and forgiveness and patience and kindness and nothing else, you've been lied to or you've bought into a lie because that's not all who he is. 50% of the real God is not any God at all. He's a selective hearing God. He's a selective hearing God. If he is love, he is also hate. God hates sin, but sin is, is, uh, uh, isn't a person. Sin isn't an entity that you can wrap up and throw into hell. Sin is just a projection of sinners, isn't it? Isn't that right? Sinners are persons. They are entities that will be wrapped up and that will be thrown into hell. This is the message of the scriptures. We have to have the message, guys. you got to have both sides of it or neither side makes sense or have any, any worth whatsoever. The all, all wrath and no forgiveness is not an accurate picture of God. And all forgiveness and love with no wrath is not an accurate picture of God. Both of them are gods that don't exist. They're gods of selective hearing. And they lead people down false paths to false conclusions. So he is forgiveness and mercy. He is also judgment and wrath. And again, the, the, the dichotomy we have a lot of times we hear people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and the God of the New Testament is a God of love. Can I just say simply, no, he's not. He's one and the same. Read carefully, not selectively, what the scripture has to say of him, both Old and New Testament. Even the book of Joel has this mercy of God. If you look back at chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, all this, you know, come to me. Even now, I'll forgive you. The book of Joel is pretty much sewed up with nothing but wrath, but it's got this mercy thrown in the midst of it, this kindness and gentleness and grace of God. So, so the, there, there's not one or the other, it's both and, not either or. Again, we say the Old Testament is a God of wrath and the New Testament is, is a God of kindness, peace, and gentleness. So here's Jesus in the New Testament saying something completely different than what your conclusion possibly is. Speaking to his disciples, notice what he says. I tell you, my friends... So these are not his enemies. These are the guys that are running with him, right? These are the 12 and the people that are sticking close to him. My friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. So I'm coming at you with a butcher knife, and Jesus says, don't be afraid of him. I'm sorry, if you're going to do that to me, I'm going to be afraid of you. I'm going to have a hard time obeying Jesus in that, just so you know. I'm just going to be, it's going to be tough for me. I'm going to try to obey Jesus in everything, but I'm thinking that's going to be tough. But Jesus is putting a comparison here, a hyperbolic comparison between that which you need to be afraid of and that which you think you need to be afraid of, which really compares, comparatively is nothing. Notice, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no. They can put you in six feet under. They can't do anything more to you, so it's not that big of a deal. Now, for us, that seems like a really big deal, doesn't it? Jesus says it's not. That can do no more. I will show you whom you should fear, he says. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Sounds like the God of the Old Testament, doesn't it? Here we are in Luke. Why? Because they're the same God. God never changes. God is the same always. He's always been a God of kindness and mercy and grace and a God of of wrath and judgment. He's always been both. He has always been both. So, so and again, 
Here, here's the standard teaching that we have, this milk toast teaching of who God is. We, we take off the sharp edges. So we look at a passage like this and we say, well, well really, you're not supposed to be afraid of God because, because, well, I don't know, I guess because Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. I don't know. But, but uh, we say, actually, fear, when it says fear God, what it actually means is that we're to hold him in reverent awe. Okay, so let's put it in, again, this juxtaposition, parabolic situation that he's got here. So, so I'm coming at you with a butcher knife, and you're not going to be afraid of me? You're going to stand in reverent awe of me, right? Watch out, I'm in reverent awe of you with a butcher knife on the other side of the door. Or, or are you going to be scared to death? First of all, I'm a Baptist preacher with a butcher knife. That ought to really scare you. <laughs> so, so I'm going to be afraid of you if you're coming at me with a butcher knife. Jesus says that should in no way have any kind of comparison to the type of fear that he's recommending that we have of the God who not only can kill you, but then has the power to throw you and the rights, I should say, to throw you into hell. He says, I tell you, fear him, reverent awe. I mean, there are times to reverently awe him, but that's not this. That is definitely not what he's saying. Whatever you are towards me with a butcher knife, you should in no way compare to how mortified and petrified and stupefied you ought to be toward the one who can throw you into hell. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. So until we stand scared, lifeless, before the God of the universe, because of our sin... The life that he offers us as an alternative to throwing us into hell makes no sense. Say that again. Until we stand lifeless before the God of the universe because of our sin, the life that he offers as an alternative to throwing us into hell makes no sense. So when we present a God with no measure of wrath and no measure of judgment... We present a God that makes no sense. So, so he isn't judgment and wrath, but Jesus dies a horrible death on the cross to pay for our sins. That makes no sense. Why didn't he just say, you know what, Jesus is really unnecessary because I'm going to let anybody in every way. I'm going to let anybody into heaven anyway, so it's no big deal. So the whole dying and bleeding to death for our sake. Make, and so, but at the other hand, I tell you, he's nothing but forgiveness and mercy. And I tell you, Jesus died for your sins. Just a nice show of, of kindness and love toward us, right? No, it was a demonstration of his wrath and his love at the same time because, because he's both, you see. You've got to have both or one or the other doesn't matter. It's not a God. He's not a God. There is no God that exists that is one or the other. You've got them selectively chosen against one another. You've selectively heard something until, listen, until I understand myself as an enemy of God and on the hate list of God, the whole issue of what God has done through his son makes no sense. Makes no difference. Why should I come to him? Why should I plead the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God if I don't think he's going to do anything to me? You see, until I understand I've got a disease here that's going to be dealt with very, very heavily, then the, then the cure to the disease makes no sense. Why would I apply the cure? Why do I need Jesus? Until the world understands his hate and judgment and wrath, it cannot appreciate what the move he's made for us to forgive and have mercy on us. It cannot appreciate it. So let's be very careful about the God, first of all, we believe in, and the God, make sure it's a biblical God and not a God of our selective hearing. Again, when we present a picture of God who's out of balance, this selective hearing God, we don't just give him 50% of God. We got God out of balance. You got no God at all. There is no God like that. There is no God out of, the out of balance God, the selective hearing God does not exist. So now we're ready with that brief introduction. Holy cow, the whole brief we're ready to look at what we're really going to talk about here with this Joel, chapter 3. Joel, Joel, remember the there is no J sound, so what is his real name? Yoel. Yoel. So the disaster of disasters that is predicted here in Joel, presented here in Joel, makes no sense, listen, if God is only love, mercy, and forgiveness. If God is only love, Mercy and forgiveness, the disaster he's speaking of, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. 
Remember, our world is on a collision course with the Almighty. They're going to meet him in a very catastrophic, cataclysmic, global sense. And that, that collision is going to do several things. It's going to be government ending, which is going to be awesome. It's going to be cruelty ending. It's going to be lie ending. It's going to be sin ending collision. It's going to be a sinner ending and life ending collision for millions, the Bible says. Millions. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God. Like I said, we, 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 want all, we don't want people to get the wrong impression of him. They already have the wrong impression of him. That's why they're not coming to Jesus. That's why they're not trusting him. That's why they're not falling down begging for mercy because they think he's, he's going to be nothing. He's just, like I said, an old grandfather in heaven letting people in the back door. No. No, he's definitely not. No, he is definitely not. So we're ready to read now in Joel chapter 3. Look down at verse 12, and we're going to go down through verse 16. And I want us to consider some of the ramifications of this day of disaster. Like I said, the day of disaster, as we saw in the last chapter, among other things, is going to be the visitation of these bug-like creatures that are not bugs, that will not respond to bug spray, that are supernatural, demonic in nature, and are going to be tormenting people during these, these last days. It's presented here in Joel. It's presented in the book of Revelation. Uh, how do we interpret it? We just let it say what it says, because that's all we can do. Verse 12 of chapter 3, notice, let the nations be aroused, come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, this is a specific place, and at the same time, not a specific place. The valley of Jehoshaphat, in non-specific terms, the name Jehoshaphat just simply means the valley of judgment. It just means judgment. It was what, it's what the guy's name was, Jehoshaphat, there's a king named that. So the, let them come up with the Valley of Judgment. It's not, maybe not a specific place, but then also it has classically been referred to as the valley system surrounding Jerusalem. There's multiple valleys, the Hinnom Valley, the, the Teropian Valley, the Kidron Valley, and then south of that toward the Dead Sea. There's all kinds of different valleys down there, and they all collectively refer to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Judgment. So let the nations be aroused and come up to the Valley of Judgment outside the city of Jerusalem. Imagine that. For there, God says, I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. You know, they have a judge at tennis matches. You know that, right? You saw that, what was it? Was that Serena? No, who was it? Serena Williams or one of them that went, one of the twin girls that went off nuts recently at the judge, right? And she got a slap on the wrist, right? Okay, the judge here in Joel, it's not going to be a tennis match he's judging, okay? It's not going to be a fine. It's not going to be probation. It's not going to be you can't come back tomorrow to see the game it's not going to be like that. And, and, and the descriptive that is given in the next verse, 13, makes it abundantly clear. Look at verse 13. We're brought in, we're introduced for the first time in the Old Testament. We're introduced to this imagery of this harvest, sickle, wine press. Watch. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the wine press is full. It's almost like it's been put in there from somewhere else, and it doesn't follow the scenario what he's talking about. So he's bringing them into a valley to judge them, right? The valley of judgment, he says there. And then it goes off into this whole treading wine and making grape juice and all this. What has that got to do with anything? The vats overflow, it says, for their wickedness is great. So, so what is he talking about? What wicked? I didn't know a grape could commit any kind of sin. Well, he's not talking about grapes. He is talking about something being treaded. He is talking about stuff getting squashed. He is talking about juice coming out of that which is squashed. But it's not grapes. It's not grapes, guys. Multitudes, verse 14. Multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness, and the Lord roars from Zion. And utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth tremble, and the Lord is a refuge, he says, for his people, and a stronghold for the sons of Israel. And it, it goes on there. So, so again, it's, it alludes to something here, a descriptive that the Bible expands on in other places and describes. And what we're going to have here, I'm going to give you an illustration or, a, or sort of an example of how, how do we come up with our conclusions of what the Bible teaches. And here's how we don't do it. We don't read here in verse 13 and say, what do you think it says? What do you think it says? What does Pastor Bill think it says? And our answer is, we don't care what any of you, including most especially Pastor Bill, thinks it says. What we do is we go to the scripture and say, what does God say that it says? 
So I found something, a descriptive in the Bible. Then I go to my concordance. Great, great tool, by the way. And I read other places in the scriptures where it speaks about treading of a wine press. And we come up with some very um, dark images. So what we're going to do here, having done that, and I'm not going to give you the time to do that. I'm going to take that you're going to trust me that I've done that. We're going to follow. I want you to follow this. And what we're going to be doing is going to be reasoning backwards. What we have here is the introduction here in the book of Joel. What we're going to start with, though, is not the introduction. We're going to start with the conclusion. And then we're going to back up. We're going to reason from conclusion to introduction. Joel, remember, is the oldest of the prophets. He writes before Isaiah, before Jeremiah, before Ezekiel. He's old. So he's the first one to introduce us this imagery of treading the wine press. He's not the last one, but he's definitely the first one. So let's consider what reasoning from the conclusion. Let's reason backwards to this place here in Joel where we have the introduction. So first of all, here, here's from the conclusion. Here's, here's the conclusion of all of it, to be sure. By, by the way, um, nowhere in the Bible is Jesus physically described, except in the book of Revelation. And nowhere in Revelation is Jesus described as this long-haired, blue-eyed Anglo person sitting in a field, green field, stroking a lamb, which is all the pictures you've seen. It's amazing to me how we have no physical description of Jesus in the Bible except the book of Revelation. And every time in Revelation, which is twice, that he's described in this case and in the first chapter, he's described as cer certainly otherworldly, to say the least. Notice, his eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him that no one knows, but he himself, and he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. By the way, this is the next Jesus that the world is going to see. Not the one, the flannel graph Jesus in your Sunday school class. That one has come and gone, re died and resurrected and ascended into heaven and gone back to who he's always been. This is who he's always been. This is the way he actually looks. So I don't know if I'm in the world and don't know Jesus and you know that this is the Jesus that's coming, I would appreciate it if you told me. I don't know how you feel about that. But I would appreciate to know. Instead of presenting me the flannel graph Jesus, who doesn't exist. He doesn't. Yes, he came and died for our sins. Yes, he was kind. Yes, a smoldering wick he would not snuff out. Nevertheless, for all eternity, this is the Jesus the world's going to see. This is the Jesus. So his eyes, blazing fire, crown on his head, name written on him when no one knows. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. It's not his blood, guys. Dipped in blood, which means it's at the bottom, right? It's at the bottom. It's not like it fell on him. It's like it came up on him. You follow me? So if I, if I, let me give you another picture. If we were in the Middle East 2,000 years ago and I came walking through town in an outfit that had the, the hems and the bottom parts of it covered in grape juice, you would automatically know what I've been doing. I've been treading a wine press. See, what happened in that back time is they would take the grapes, once they harvest them, they would put them in a basin, they would carve out a place in the ground, uh, out of stone, or they would make, make a, quite often they would make a place, a, a basin area out of, out of uh, like a ceramic, and they would heat it and make it a very hard place. And they would put the grapes in this basin, and then we would walk around on them in our bare feet, stomp them. Can't, can't wear sandals, because if you wear sandals, something a little bit harder than skin will crush not only the grape, but also the seed in it. And of course, I don't know if you last time you ate a grape seed, it's a little bit bitter. And so you want the sweet, but you don't want the bitter. And so we walk around on bare feet and we crush these grapes. And so I'm trampling all these grapes in my Sunday go to meet and stuff. What's going to happen? One drop of grape juice gets on you. What? There it is. We know what he's been doing. I mean, you'd be up to here in purple, right? And so we got one coming down from heaven, judging part of his apparel is covered from the bottom up in blood. What does that mean? Well, again, we're adding Scripture to Scripture. Let's keep going. Reasoning from the conclusion in Revelation 19 backwards toward the introduction. So here sounds like exactly what we've just read in the book of Joel, chapter, chapter 3, verse 13. This whole harvesting of grapes, put in the sickle, right? Gather the clusters of grapes to the earth, from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. Is it talking about grapes or talking about people? The angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered his grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Is that the kind of God that you believe in? If not, you need to make some adjustments. 
They were trampled, notice, the grapes or whatever they were, in the wine press outside the city, always referenced to, G- to Jerusalem. Same scenario we got here in, in Joel. And the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle, somewhere around four feet, for the distance of 1,600 stadia, so close to 200 miles, blood four feet deep. Now, he's not talking about grapes. He's talking about people. God, grapes don't sin. God doesn't have a problem with grapes. He's got a problem with people. He's got a problem with sin because sin is what? A projection of sinners. Can't judge sin without judging, if, without judging the sinners, right? That's exactly right. Jesus took our sin. What happened to him? Well, look at the cross. You want to know God's opinion of sin? How about being trampled for sure, blood coming out for sure? Well, listen, the one who was trampled for our sake on that day is coming back to do the trampling. And, and again, is it graphic? Everybody say, that's in the Bible? That's in the Bible, guys. Make sure you know your Bible. Make sure you know your Bible. And again, we may say, well, that maybe, maybe it's not Jesus. I just showed you that he had robe dipped in blood. There is significant evidence, but let's keep reasoning backwards. So we're going back from the New Testament back to the Old Testament to a prophet who came after Joel, a guy by the name of Isaiah. And Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 4, is where this reference is. It says this, Who is this who comes from Edom? That's southwest of Jerusalem. Marching in the greatness of his strength. So here's a question. Here's an answer. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Who is that? Well, we know him, right? It's the Son of God. We know who he is. Just that what he's about to do may not be what you think he's going to do. Mighty to save, here's the question. Why is your apparel red? Your garment's like one who treads the wine press. Oh, boy, here we go. See, we hadn't had to come up with anything because the Bible teaches this stuff. We just got to know where to go. Just got to know where to go. We don't have to come up with, oh, I don't know what it means this, what it means that. What do you think it means? Who cares what we think? What does the Bible say? So it says, indeed, it is Jesus who has his garments like one who treads the wine press. And then he answers. He says, "Why, why are you like that? He says, because I've trodden. The wine trough alone. And from the peoples, it says, there was no man with me. I also trod them, referring to the peoples, in my anger, in my trample them, in my wrath. Is that the God you had going on before we got here this Sunday? It's the God of the Bible. And their life blood was sprinkled on my garments. Wow. And I stained all my raiment for the day of my vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption has come. And yep, that's in the Bible. That is in the Bible. See, the same Jesus who died for you, the same Jesus who sacrificed his life for you, who offers life to you, is the same one who's going to come in with a great authority and judge. And is it going to be bad, that collision? Apparently Apparently, the same, the same it, it, we have to adjust our opinion of God and the position of God and understand this is who we, the full orb position of who he is. You say, well, I don't, I don't see him that way. Yeah, you're not experiencing him that way because he's restraining himself. You're not seeing him acting that way because he's holding himself back, but it is who he is. And it is what he will do. Mark every word carefully because not a one is going to fall to the ground. He's going to do it. So, so, so we have this this if you will, this full understanding of who God is and why would I, unless I know this about Jesus, why would I ever come and ask him for forgiveness? If all he is is just kindness and love, if all he is is just going to forgive me anyway, don't worry about it. It was no big deal. Ten commandments, ah, we just threw them out. Don't worry. No big deal. Don't worry about it. Unless you understand him as a judge who's going to hold you accountable for every last thing then coming to him for salvation makes no sense. Crying out to him and saying, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, it says. Why? Because that's his heart. Again, re- read with me back, back up to chapter 2 of, of Joel. Notice he's already stated his heart here in verse 12. Yet, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. But I would say not only gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, but not only slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. 
relenting in evil, because that's what he preferred. He prefers that. But it's not only what he is. Make sure that the God that you have is not a selective God. You're just selected the stuff that you want to know. And yeah, I know your experience is the same as mine. God's being so good to us when he owes us nothing good. So, so why is it that way? Well, I, heard, I read something recently in uh, Wall Street Journal. I don't get the journal, by the way, because i got too much better things to do with my brain. But uh, nonetheless, there was a statement in there I thought was interesting. Here's what it said. It said, people want to be lightly governed by a strong government. Isn't that right? I want a government that can blow anybody out of the water. But I, on the other hand, want that same government to not do, to leave me completely alone. I don't want you to know nothing. I don't want you looking at my Facebook page. I don't want you knowing my phone number. I don't want it bothers me the fact that, you know, I don't know if y'all got a message from the president the other day just to test. Everybody get that on their phone. You know why? Because he's capable of that. They're capable of getting a hold of you because you got, you got, he can call you anytime he wants. You can have a conversation with the president. I did. I called him right back and he didn't say anything. <laughs> read all, read all. Uh, I, I want a powerful government who has the touch on everyone else. I want them to know all about you weirdos out there. I just don't want him messing with me at all. Isn't that right? Why, why are we like that? We, we do that. We, we think about it. We, we, have, we want our dad to be powerful, protective. I want to be able to go to bed at night knowing my dad is taking care of us and he's going to guard our home and he, he's being the, dad, the way a dad ought to be. And at the same time, when I'm in trouble, I want him to be kind and gentle and compassionate and soft and caring towards me, right? And, and at the same time, we want a policeman to be uh, armed. I want, his, I want his gun loaded, don't you? I really do. I don't want him carrying like Barney Fife, a bullet in his pocket. I want him armed. I want him armed. At the same time, if I'm a kid, I want him to be the same guy that can put me on his shoulders and carry me through the fair because I've lost my mom and dad. You know, uh, powerful, powerful on the one hand, uh, strong, but at the same time, lightly governed. And we want lots of muscle and at the same time, lots of restraint. And that's the same way that our government, we want our government to be for us. And the reason why we want that is because that's exactly the way God governs, isn't it, right? So you sin this week and you're not drop dead. Why? Because, because God it prefers love, kindness, forgiveness. That's what he prefers. That's what he wants. That's his desire. He'd prefer you to never know him like this, nor the world. The fact is, it's not gonna, it was just not going to go the way he wants. He is going to have to be this. But he prefers you to know him as this, as it says here in the book of Luke. Come unto me, Jesus says, all, the same Jesus. Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's who he wants to be. That's who he loves to be. That's what he prefers. That's, if you will, the side of him that he wants you to know. He doesn't want you to know by experience. Yes, you need to know the whole thing of all he is, but he doesn't want you to know by experience this. He wants you to know by experience his grace. His love, his kindness, his mercy, his gentleness by experience. But, but that ball is in your court. It really is. I'm going to ask you if you would bow your heads, close your eyes with me as we consider and pray about the things that God has taught us. What, what incredible things there are to know about God. And again, we, we, we shrink back from these more... Uh, vivid descriptives, these more um, explicit things because we say, well, we don't want people to get the wrong impression of God. Are we really in charge of God's image? Are we really in charge of, are we his press? Are we the, the, his media that determines what gets out and what doesn't get out? Or, or, or isn't it true that we're just responsible good or bad, like it or love it, feel good or feel sick, is, aren't we just responsible for giving out the truth? God, I thank you that you are the truth. I thank you that all that you are is all that we really need to know and that we need not be afraid of any particular part of you because it's all of you. 
that brings the message home. It's, it's the part of wrath that we have to understand or we won't understand the mercy. It's, it's, the, it's the great anger you have towards sin and what you will do to sinners if they don't repent that brings us to repentance. It brings us to the place where we say, God, forgive me. Jesus, save me. God, I thank you that you have offered to us this, this offer of peace, the only peace with you that comes through your son that comes through his sacrifice. I thank you for again for the cross and how we see at that one time both your great love for sinners and your great judgment of sin all at the same time. I pray, God, if there was one person here who hasn't availed himself of that great love, that way that you really want to be known, if they would do that today, calling on a Savior to save them. Thank you, God, that you respond to all calls of that nature. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.